to see you as we gather together. Um, you should have an older service. There are some large print versions of it around as well if you need more clothes. Um, everything you have and need is in there. I'll keep the announcements to the various minimum. Just notice if it's about standing or sitting. Uh, and for the majority of it, uh, we'll be led by our uh, August choir here. Thank you all, choir. We meet on um, this Sunday, which we know as Passion Sunday, the fifth Sunday of Lent. That's a time when we're looking almost forwards now towards uh, Holy Week and the Cross, and sort of the distant memory of Ash Wednesday uh, seems a long time ago. It's also there, of course, the day when the clocks change, so it's rather special, I think, having choral links on the day when, during the service, things get a little darker. Just, just about the light when you get sunset technically, not going to see much sun today. It is uh, 7.22, you can tell the chat, can't you? 7.22, so it should just about the light, that sort of fading light that really marks this service for the end of the day. I invite you then to stand to sing our opening hymn, Praise to the Holiness in the Heart. <laughs> Oh, 
First lesson is from Jeremiah, chapter 31, verses 27 to 37, page 793 in the Pew Bibles. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will plant the kingdoms of Israel and Judah with the offspring of people and of animals. Just as I watched over them to uproot and tear down, and to overthrow, destroy, and bring disaster, so I will watch over them to build and to plant, declares the Lord. In those days, people will no longer say, the parents have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. Instead, everyone will die for their own sin. Whoever eats sour grapes, their own teeth will be set on edge. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant that I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. <clears throat> no longer will they teach their neighbour or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. This is what the Lord says. He who appoints the sun to shine by day, who decrees the moon and stars to shine by night, who stirs up the sea, so that it waves roar, the Lord Almighty is his name. Only if these decrees vanish from my sight, declares the Lord, will Israel ever cease being a nation before me. This is what the Lord says. Only if the heavens above can be measured, and the foundations of the earth below be searched out, will I reject all the descendants of Israel because of all they have done, declares the Lord.
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil.
prayer for the King's Majesty. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, high and mighty, King of kings, Lord of lords, the only ruler of princes, who dost from thy throne behold all the dwellers upon earth. Most heartily we beseech thee with thy favour to behold our most gracious sovereign Lord, King Charles, and so replenish him with the grace of thy Holy Spirit, that he may always incline to thy will and walk in thy way. Endue him plenteously with heavenly gifts. Grant him in health and wealth long to live. Strengthen him that he may vanquish and overcome all his enemies. And finally, after this life, he may attend everlasting joy and felicity. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. A prayer for the royal family. Almighty God, the fountain of all goodness, we humbly beseech thee to bless Camilla, the Queen Consort, William, Prince of Wales, the Princess of Wales, and all the royal family. Endue them with thy Holy Spirit. Enrich them with thy heavenly grace. Prosper them with all happiness, and bring them to thine everlasting kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. A prayer for our nation. O Lord, bless this kingdom and commonwealth, that there may be peace and prosperity within its borders. In peace, so preserve it that it corrupts not. In trouble, so defend it that it suffer not, and so order it, whether in plenty or in want, that it may faithfully serve thee and patiently seek thy kingdom, the only sure foundation of people and nations. Through Jesus Christ, our Saviour and Redeemer. Amen. Prayer for those in need. Eternal Lord Christ, who are the strength of all that trust in thee, we bring now into thy presence thy servants who need thy help. We know now what is best for them, but thou knowest. Lay thy healing hand upon them, we beseech thee giving them all that is needful for health of body, mind, and spirit. Grant them patience and endurance, with a perfect dependence on thy never-failing love, and work in them the good pleasure of thy will, who livest and reignest with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, world without end. Amen. Amen. We remember the recently departed, especially Derek Knight, Joy Holt, Felicity Lee, Felicity Lever, Finn Wilson, and Lynn Gray. Grant unto us, O God, to trust thee not for ourselves alone, but for those also whom we love and who are hid from us by the shadow of death, that as we believe thy power to have raised our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead, so we may trust thy love to give eternal life to all who believe in him, through the same Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now let's keep a time of silence for our own prayers.
prayer of St. Chrysostom. Almighty God, who has given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplications unto thee, and dost promise that when two or three are gathered together in thy name, thou wilt grant their requests. Fulfill now, O Lord, the desires and petitions of thy servants, as may be most expedient for them, granting us in this world knowledge of thy truth, and in the world to come life everlasting. Amen. Let's close our prayers by sharing together in the words of the grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be with us all, evermore. Amen. We sing together the hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. Jesus has come to Jerusalem for Passover. It's the second 
uh, recorded Passover that Jesus attended with the disciples, but this time, for the last time. But as was the case on his first trip, he comes with an intimate group of friends from the rural thing to this urban setting, now in the midst of the crowd, it's there in chapter 2 and here in chapter 12. We know he stayed along the way as he often did, but this time his visits was also visits of grief. He's just visited the home of his friend Lazarus outside the village and his sisters Mary and Martha on the way. Growing crowds follow him because he's just performed in John's Gospel his last sign. That raising of Lazarus from the dead. And it's an amazing event that must have been because it's clearly spoken about. So in between that and the reading we heard from John's Gospel, there is that triumphant entry into Jerusalem. The things we remember next week as we call on, on Sunday. But in our reading, we gather that among those who go up to Jerusalem to worship for the Passover festival, for what John calls Greeks. Well, who were they? Why were they there? Well, there is that interpretation the Greeks were non Jews, Gentiles, or maybe converts of Judaism, and therefore they're pointing to the direction of the future of Christianity. As St. Paul makes clear, there's no longer Greek or free, Gentile, Jew, male, female, all one in Christ. And while that is an amazing truth, I think that's unlikely here. The word John uses the word Hellenis, it's quite a common word nowadays, isn't it, to refer to the nation of Greece. But that's more about here where they come from rather than their religious pagan Gentile background. Because what would motivate Gentiles to travel a long distance to worship at Jerusalem for the Passover? More meaning, might be meaning, is these Greeks that uh, used to be. Uh, Part of the community at Jerusalem, and somehow, maybe because of work, uh, they left the country and now travelled across to Greece. And John seems to support that. They're now settled in Greenland, and they're doing as many still do today, making a pilgrimage back to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. Now, back to the events that John records from the conclusion of that last sign, the raising of Lazarus. Many now believe in him. This crowd who witnessed the raising of Lazarus from the dead continue to testify about it. Those in the crowd continue to follow him. And that may include these Jewish Greeks. Quite understandably then, this group want to see Jesus. Now, if you read between the lines in in fact, it's explicit in our reading, they never do. Oh, this is a story from a distance, but clearly they wanted an intimate conversation with him. Interesting, they make a request through Philip, on whose name suggests he again was from a Greek background. And he tells Andrew, and together they tell Jesus. It would simply be easy, wouldn't it, if Jesus granted the request of these people, even though it was now third hand, but no. Jesus answers them with teaching on the meaning of his death, and that's the, the heart of our Bible reading this evening. But what's going on? Well, Jesus' words on the meaning of his death and implications for discipleship echo some things in the Gospel of Mark, and this strange relationship that in order to gain our relationship with God, we need to give up on the things of the world, a very Lenten theme. And John therefore focuses on the conflict between the life of discipleship and the ruler of the world. The world in this context means the one who is in charge. And those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Because the world is under judgment and the ruler of this world is already defeated. So what John is doing in Jesus' speech is preparing us for what is to follow. This is now looking forward, as already said. And I wonder if I can encourage you, whatever your own Lenten discipline has been or continues to be, over these next one, a couple of weeks, I wonder if you could read through one of the Passion narratives, those last 
chapters from the Gospels. I don't know if you know it, I'm sure you do, how the Gospels are made up. Two thirds of it uh, is concerned with the two and a half, nearly three years of Jesus' life, and a third of each of the Gospels just in that last week of Jesus' life. And that, and that is no accident. So the Gospels are leading to. Yes, Jesus is a good teacher, a good man, but that's almost incidental to Jesus, the Son of God, dying on the cross. But John has a particular focus of where that's going to lead. According to John, Jesus' death and, re and resurrection are a judgment against earthly powers, and ultimately a victory over them. There is a strange picture of things going on. In death, Jesus gains God's glory. And what seems like victory for the Romans who fear Jesus and the Jewish leaders who see him as a blasphemer, his death brings victory to God and defeat for them. There is a deep irony in there. And this use of irony to assert, assert Jesus' victory over these earthly powers is prominent as we read through from this point, John's Gospel in particular. The Gospel of John then gives Jesus these imperial titles like king. Pilate intends to mock the Jews by calling Jesus their king. The soldiers ridicule Jesus by dressing him in royal purple garb and call him king. Pilate has all this inscription on the cross to read, king of the Jews. And the irony is that in all those acts, which they just saw as a bit of fun, maybe a bit of mockery, they speak the truth. For those who can see what appears to be the devastating power of a Roman authority is actually its defeat. Jesus' resurrection is the ultimate victory over all earthly powers and all those who seek to run away from God. So, these God-fearing Greeks wish to see Jesus. And even though, humanly speaking, Jesus didn't have a one-to-one -one personal encounter with them, because they were there for the Passover festival, they will have seen Jesus. They will have seen him on the cross. If you dare to think, they might have seen him in his resurrection power as well. But when that's not quite the point, and quite often in John's Gospel there are these hidden meanings as well. This is the gospel that concludes with Jesus' words to Thomas. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. So we find in this passage, as in many passages in God, John's gospel, the purpose of the gospel to record Jesus' signs, there were seven of them in John's gospel, for those who have not seen yet come to believe. So perhaps these seeking Greeks represent those of us for whom the Gospel is written. They and we will not receive a one-to-one -one personal audience with Jesus apart from in prayer, of course. But the truth is revealed to them along with us. In that speech, in John 12, for telling the meaning of his death, that it puts us right with God, it calls us to abandon self and to follow Him. And I wonder if we might then see Jesus in a new way this Passion Time, this Holy Week, this Easter. The call to engage in prayer, to read God's Word, and to look out for Jesus, to encounter Him afresh, as we will over these next couple of weeks. Here, the familiar events read on. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Lord Jesus, these Greeks said we would see Jesus. And Lord Jesus, thank you, we can see you. We can see you as our crucified Messiah, in our risen Lord, in the sender of the Holy Spirit, in our daily companion, the one in whom we put our trust, the one who restores us to eternal life, the one in whose relationship with means that our lives are forever changed. That 
us to see you, Lord Jesus, over these next few weeks and into our futures. Amen. Amen. Uh, because we couldn't get the staff, um, there will actually not be a collection plate going round. Um, if you wish to leave a donation, please do so uh, in the back, or maybe you can put it in the, uh, the little jar at the back of the church as you leave. Uh, but now we conclude our service uh, by standing to sing our hymn, My Song is Love Unknown. <laughs>